Hello, ABF and the audience at large. Welcome to our next Sunday study here. I am Pastor Colin, and here gracing my presence is Pastor Josh. What up? And uh, yeah, today we're continuing our discussion on discipleship and specifically kind of the, the deeper foundational scriptural principles and doctrines behind that. And so let's um, just kick it off with a word of prayer together, and then we'll get going. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for the time that we get to be together um, as a body and a community, even a worldwide community. Thank you for giving us your, your word and your commands and your promises and just all of the resource that is packed into the authoritative word of the Bible. And I pray that you be with us today and that your Holy Spirit work in us and amongst us to uh, grow us and glorify you. Um, and we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So last week, we talked about how Scripture testifies to God's priority for discipleship, right? Both implicitly and explicitly, and how the second person of the Trinity is the eternal Son of God, and just by nature of that, like there's a discipleship relationship there, how he came in the flesh and was a disciple of the Father and repeatedly showed us just his reliance on going to the Father over and over again, looking for his will and his um, understanding and wisdom and guidance and all those different things. And uh, then how Jesus specifically took disciples as the means of building his church and how even, you know, in the Old Testament times, God approached and led individuals like Abraham and Moses and different kings and prophets, people who were expected to lead others in turn, right? But God specifically targeted individuals. That's how he chose to do it. And even in how God selected one small nation, right, Israel, to be his disciple amongst the nations of the earth. And then explicitly, right, at the end of the New Testament or at the end of the Gospels, we see God pushes the point of discipleship through the Great Commission, which we'll talk more about today. So what exactly is being commanded in the Great Commission in regard to discipleship? Well, let's go ahead and start it off by reading that passage in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. So there's a, several different things in there, but the primary thrust of that sentence of go and make disciples is not so much the go, but the, the make part of it. And this is just the real um, overall consensus of, of Greek scholars on this thing. It's one of the hardest words that I've personally come across <laughs> trying to pronounce in Greek. It is, uh, yeah, mathai. Ma Matthaito. That's not it either. Um, yeah. Looks like Matthaito. Matthaito. Yeah, that sounds. That seems right. It's like, I don't know. It's just a really, especially looking at it visibly, it's just kind of crazy. But the root of that word <laughs> is Mathetes, um from you know math, which means the mental effort needed to think something through, which is kind of interesting you know, root of the root of that. And properly, it's like a learner or a disciple or or a, a follower of Christ who learns the doctrines of Scripture and the lifestyle that they require or uh, someone catechized with proper instruction from the Bible with its necessary follow-through and life applications. And, you know, just that, that um, Greek root math, um, the mental effort needed to think something through. I think that's really representative of what um, the goal of making disciples is, is um, counseling and have somebody follow you in terms of figuring out how to really think things through in life, not by the world's definition of stuff, right? But by God's wisdom and how he has commanded us to look at things and process things and live in response to it. Um, 
so yeah, these disciples are people who learn life from you, go governed by the scriptures and their doctrines, um, which is kind of a convenient definition for me personally on this month of of the doctrine of discipleship. Mm. Um, but all these things, <clears throat> they're followed by teach these new disciples to obey the commands I've given you, right? And this indicates a continuing relationship just to establish this firmly. Um, <clears throat> it's one of teaching and much more to come later in discussion. But this is a continuing relationship of teaching these new disciples to obey the commands that have been given by Christ and by the rest of Scripture. Um, does this mean that we go to the ends of the earth to make new disciples of Christ? I mean, it does, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that we have to do that right here and right now all the time? No, of course not. In fact, where was the like? Where did the original disciples spend most of their time for the first many years? Yeah. Well, I think. <clears throat> I mean, I think it. I think the formal process of making disciples, as is thought out, is something that is not what they did, right? So, like the idea of evangelizing and proselytizing and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. that is that's a part of making disciples, but but the every day, all the time, no matter what you're doing, going back to the Old Testament, you know, where it said with your children, no matter what you're doing, whether you're walking, eating, sleeping, whatever you're doing, you're constantly um, following God. That does happen all the time and right. no matter where you are. So that formalized process is really what we're talking about right now. And that's, I think what you're talking about right now is kind of what we talked about last week mm -hmm. about how the system didn't come first. God didn't create a system like that, you know, an organization of churning out disciples. He said, this is who I am. Therefore, follow me and also make disciples one mm -hmm. at a time, you know, mm -hmm. and that spontaneously will spread to all the nations of the earth if people are authentically responding to the call of God's spirit and following his commands in that way and, and loving people. Yeah. Well, I, I would just... I would just note one at a time, meaning personally, because you yes. can make more than one disciple at a time. Jesus made 12 at a time or even more. or more. Yeah. But each one having a personal relationship with you. So if you're, if you're having, if you have so many disciples that you don't have a personal relationship with them specifically, then that's not really making a disciple. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> So in regard to us, though, like this is Jesus talking to his original uh, 12 disciples, possibly more that were around and, and witnessing to that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always the question of, well, was this a, you know, was this more a specific command for the people that were starting the church, like the original apostles and disciples? Or was it, does that legitimately translate down to us? And really the answer to that lies in the, the scope of what Christ is asking, right? Go and make disciples of all nations. Well, is that something that the 12 could do or the 70 or the, you know, couple thousand that were converted at Pentecost? It's like, no way. The world is an enormous place, even at that time, with just millions upon millions of people. And it was expected to be passed along. Like that command, mm -hmm. um, when Christ gave it, he wasn't saying... This is your guys' job. Make sure you finish it before you kick the bucket. Like he was saying, you're making disciples. This is a sustainable model that I'm giving you. And that translates all the way down to us with the same exact um, force that was given to his disciples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so last week we talked about how important discipleship is to God personally and how central it is to his plan and his very identity that we do continue this commission. Um, but we're also accountable to this by that direct command, which endures to the end of the age, I think, which is the implication of that. When he says, I will be with you to the end of the age at the end of the Great Commission, you know, that's not just out of nowhere. He's mm -hmm. like, as you're in this process of making disciples, I'm going to be with you in that. I will be the master of each one of your disciples. I will be your master um 
and they can follow you as you follow me. Like that's the thought process and the chain that goes back to Christ always, right? Um, but before we get into some of what discipleship rightly addresses in that with repentance and obedience and all these things, um, Josh, I just want to ask you, you know, about your personal experience and processing of discipleship. Like you've had a lot of discipleship relationships in your time. You've been um, doing those things out of your own conviction and pursuit. And many people have been attracted to you in that way, partly because, you know, your gifting and teaching and your presence and authority, like you have all these God-given things and personally developed things, you know. But what about God's idea of discipleship has driven you to continually like take up that mantle? Well, so I think I think the the term discipleship is loaded, um, first of all, and I I don't think that it should. Well, I don't think that it's loaded with the right things. So the term discipleship is like loaded with sort of like cult like ideas like if we're just being honest where you have like a cult leader like focused on the person yeah it's it's very sort of gnostic in in nature almost like you have like a like a star wars like sith apprentice sort of sort of thing going on yeah. but the but the biblical model of discipleship isn't really that right the biblical model of discipleship and just, to, and just to say that's probably um partially at fault or whatever for pressuring the current modern church from sort of pulling away from discipleship. Right. Because it, it has this nasty connotation. Um, creeper vibe. Yeah. But the, the biblical model of discipleship is open to all in the sense that the information isn't to hidden information. The purpose of discipleship is not to take something that's, that's hidden and then pass it down to another person who can then hide that. Um, and then for you guys to sort of be your super group. Um, you In know, fact, one of the first things that you do when you're discipling somebody scripturally is you lead them to Christ, right? They repent and they're right. baptized, which right. is a public witness. You're like, this is what's going on. This is our right. relationship. We are now brothers. Yeah. Let's go. Well, so I think that I think that it's important for people to understand that it is the, the edict there is to follow me as I follow Christ, right? And so you have to look at what Christ did and why he did it. And I think that it's undeniable that it is to be an aspect of what we do. Uh, that's that's really the long and short of it. Um, I think that we are to disciple. And, and so I think that a lot of people don't have discipleship relationships because they don't have that first premise that it is it is a responsibility for us to disciple. Does that make sense? Yeah. What you're saying is that discipleship is not a side quest of Christianity. Right. Discipleship is Christianity. Right. Exactly. So for me, in my personal experience, I just, I start from that first premise and uh, I have personally tried to A, look for mentorship relationships for myself and then B, tried to be that. And I think it really just comes down to the idea that there's a type of meaningful relationship that we're supposed to have that a lot of people don't have, and they're starving for that. I know on a personal level that I have starved for certain types of relationships as well. And so, you know, our, our responsibility as Christians is to supply the endless, so the endless supply. We're sort of suppliers for Christ, right? So the endless supply of the bread of life and the the, the never-ending uh, fountain of life. Um, and when you consider that people come into your, your sphere all the time who are thirsty for this and are struggling and you make it apparent that you have these things, discipleship becomes organic. It becomes a natural thing that happens as you continue to supply that. I just want to, again, emphasize the fact that the point of discipleship is not to create your own small relationship where you're at the head of it, but to introduce people to Christ so that now they're sort of elevated next to you. They become your brothers and sisters with Christ as their their father. Yeah, because if you were to make 
a disciple of you, then you get to the telephone phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Where it, with each copy, it diminishes more and more, right? right? But you want to connect people to the original um, example of discipleship. Yeah. And, and so lastly, I would just say that I think you have to be, you have to be open to the fact that there's varying levels of maturity that everybody has. And so there are certain things that I know that I'm capable of discipling people in, and I'm aware of that. There are other things that I'm not so great at, and I want to be discipled in that process. All of those things falling under the umbrella of who Christ is and the giftings that he gives his church. And so um, I think in just in my ministry, what has been unique for me has really only been the idea that at a base level, I am to disciple and to be discipled. Beyond that, it's, you know, it's just what you kind of do. And if you do that as a Christian, you will take on multiple disciples and you will be discipled by them in the various things. You know, it's a kind of cliche, but we talk about how we, uh, you've heard how like teachers learn from their students and children, uh, parents learn from their children. And, you know, at the end of the day, you've got, you know, a biblical model of that and say like Peter, for instance, who was a direct disciple of the physical incarnation of Christ, who was discipled later by uh, Paul. And that, that, that moment where Paul corrects him, I think it's in Galatians, uh, that moment where Paul corrects him, that's a discipleship moment, yeah, right? Definitely. So there, and, but you listen to Paul and he talks about how he went and got, some discipleship from the uh, the Jewish council of believers and was um, affirmed by them also. So there's, you know, it's, it's a give and take thing. Discipleship is not this master apprentice relationship except with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note, I think too, like when Paul goes to the, to the believers um, that the original the disciples and apostles, like, he was looking to make sure his doctrine specifically was in sync yeah. with the teaching and ministry of Christ. Well, and specifically, he wasn't, it was going both ways, right? Like, yeah. he wanted to make sure that their doctrine was right. in yeah, sync yeah, yeah. with what he had in direct revelation from Christ and wanted to make sure that all of that message was cohesive and that their work of unified discipleship you know, across the spectrum of the, the body of Christ was like all running in the same direction. Yeah. One last point I want to make about that, that I think is really important. My pastoral um, ministry, which has included discipleship, is not the same thing as my uh, Christian ministry, which is discipleship. And I think that there's this weird idea that pastors disciple and nobody else does you know, pastors or elders in the church or whatever. That's not true. And I was pastoring after I was discipling um, and being discipled. And so I think it is the responsibility of every Christian, not just those who become pastors or officers in the church to disciple and to be discipled. So I want to be clear about that. I don't consider that a part of my, uh, I don't consider that a outworking of my pastoral ministry. My pastoral ministry has become an outworking of my push to discipleship. Yeah, because the base level is closer to discipleship than mm -hmm. pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, a, you know, one could argue that somebody that has taken somebody as a disciple is just a pastor of one. You yeah, know? totally. Like that's what it is. You're a shepherd. You just got one sheep for now or, you know, two or three or however many disciples you mm -hmm. happen to have at the time. Okay. Um, great. So the only other thing that I thought about with you in particular is that I know adoption has been um, close to your heart in terms of how you've operated your life. Mm -hmm. I just, for a quick second, um, can you speak to like the, the crossover between adoption and discipleship in terms of how God like views things and, and understands things? Yeah, I think so. Obviously God is adoptive in nature. If it's not obvious to you, then you're not reading scripture. And our relationship with God is entirely adoptive. Mm -hmm. um, that's people think that we're children of God 
that that moniker of children of God. We are the redheaded stepchild of God. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're that moniker that we're children of God that we've taken on. That everybody's a child of God. That's not actually theologically correct. We are children of God because He adopted us into His family, um, made us citizens of His family. So. God is adoptive in nature. That's the way he does things. And I think that that is a familial outworking or perhaps discipleship is a non-familial outworking. It's, it's a sphere of, of the social uh, identity of, of a Christian, right? Uh, in much the same way, in probably exactly the same way as the family is the core point of society, you know, you start with a family and then that family expands, expands, expands. And then eventually you have, you know, a village and a, and a city and then, you know, a nation or whatever. But at the heart of it is the family. So this idea of taking somebody who isn't a part of your family and grafting them into your family and giving them your identity so they can participate in the blessings is inherent in the concept of discipleship. Yeah. It shares the same DNA as adoption, and right. that makes sense because it all comes from the nature of who God is. So for me, and I, I'm not saying this has to be for everybody, but for me, adoption into my own family uh, is something that I think is a natural outworking of the concept of discipleship and of of God's adoptive nature. Mm. Yeah, it's all, it's like the spirit of adoption is like the heart of discipleship. Mm -hmm. you know played out outside the family yeah yeah or played out inside the family yeah 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 um okay well so we we sort of spontaneously brought up the question of you know is it everybody's responsibility to disciple others and what does that look like so i think a valid question on that is you know is there a particular age or time when you're ready to disciple others because if you're a believer and you're kind of freaked out by uh, discipleship or you feel not ready, um, that is n natural in our fearful and sinful nature, but it's not how God intended it to be, mm -hmm. right? And so you should also, if you are um, an active and growing believer, uh, you should feel a pressure, at least in the background, to, um, you know, adopt and disciple others uh, as you're growing and you're you're maturing so when is the age or time well <clears throat> a few things i think um when you're allowing scripture to govern your life to a significant significant extent obviously if you're you know you adopted the label christian and you're living by the world standards what are you going to disciple right <laughs> now obviously that is something that you should be growing in, and this is a whole process and continuum. But um, I just think about the, the log and the spec principle, right? Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 5. Let's take a look at that. Good. Hey, guys. If we cut out there, sorry about that little technical difficulties, but I believe we're coming right in after that last scripture reading about the log and the spec. So <clears throat> point number one. Christ is making, you know, don't be so quick to judge, like just in general, as he's talking about this stuff. This was a Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching to a broad audience. Mm -hmm. um, but point number two, following quickly behind that's sort of implicit in that teaching is judge effectively, right? He doesn't say do not judge ever, period. He says judge and you will be judged by the same standard. So be careful about that. And if you got a big fat log in your eye, don't be worried about the little speck in your friend's eye. But if you are stepping up to take on a disciple as part of your commission and just being a faithful disciple yourself of Christ, then you're going to need to judge. And so you have to be able to judge effectively to actually help. So whether the question whether you're ready to take a disciple or not, well, disciples range from, you know, small children to mature adults. And so there's quite the range there. And this, this teaching from Christ, it lets us um, to be discerning about that, about what level of discipleship that you should be ready to take on. You know, like we've got people that are teenagers that are very much figuring out their life still, but they're ready to take on a six-year-old, seven, eight, 
10 year old in you know, theory. kid in theory in yeah. theory not all of them are not all teenagers are some of them again going back to the principle of of allowing scripture to govern your life in a general sense and working toward that like if that's not in place then you're not going to be in a place to even disciple a six-year-old that six-year-old could be more mature than a 16 year old um but hopefully if you are a christian and you're following um the biblical teachings of scripture and you are coming to god in prayer and you're being governed by the spirit and being sanctified more and more each day pretty soon you're going to be ready to take that on um but on the flip side of things if you you need to not be afraid to judge right and you need to be able to to accept that consequence because if you have a disciple the worst thing you can do is to not judge them so mm -hmm. count the cost of discipleship in this way and count it as a blessing because is it a burden yes it is yeah. but it's a necessary blessing both for you and your disciple i think it's important to understand that there's a innate connection between the word disciple and discipline mm -hmm. and discipline is not it's not re retribution it's not you know punitive in nature Discipline is not what I'm punitive. I mean punishment. Um, <clears throat> discipline is about returning something to its rightful uh, standard, right? And so the idea is that we are disciples of Christ. There's a right path that we're supposed to be on. We are to discipline ourselves. So when we're discipling, what we're doing is we are moving people to that right standard, and that requires judgment. If you have no judgment, you have no discipline, which means you have no discipleship. So it's those two are connected. And oftentimes we don't think of it that way. We think of it as just somebody to walk through life with. And I think that that is a low standard. Yeah. The uh, vague support system. You yeah. Know? It, is, it is a low standard by which a person can enter into a discipleship relationship, but it is probably better for someone to view themselves as being discipled at that, at that maturity level than it is for them to view themselves as discipling others. That being said, um, if they view themselves as in need of discipleship, I think that it is completely fine for them to be discipling others um, as long as they are uh, submitting to being disciplined by others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's always going to be different scales. And um, like Scripture talks about, our Father in Heaven disciplines us, and that shows um, his love and his adoptive relationship mm -hmm. with us, you know, and so it just trickles down and um, that's what we're to do is to to not so much be the one to like discipline and enact punishment or, or right. whatever, but we are to connect people to God's discipline. Well, and you can you can see this in the family again. You know, I have three bio children and they're varying about five years in age, right? So None of them is the end all be all within the family to say this is uh, you are going to receive judgment on this. Uh, sorry, I am going to judge you based on this standard. But all of them can warn the the next step down. Hey, you are going to receive judgment if you don't follow the standard of the family. Look at my look at how I've dealt with this and here's how you can deal with it. That's discipleship. Yeah, definitely. And owning that. And that's one of the first things that we teach an older brother or older sister, right? Mm -hmm. Like your younger brother or sister is going to be looking to you as an example. Like what you're saying is whether you like it or not, you're in a introductory discipleship relationship. So mm -hmm. you better treat it correctly, mm -hmm. right? That's what we warn our children. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, even that base level of implicit discipleship is and should be present within the church. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not intuitive anymore, um, even within the family, right? You have basically an every man for themselves mentality, no longer coming to the dinner table to meet, no longer seeing their identity as one just wanting to get past it and get out. And there's something like that happened that's happened at least in the Western church where uh, our religion is this individualistic thing. It's just my relationship with God. Don't tell me what works for you. Don't tell me what I should do don't hold a high standard uh yeah that's that's not supposed to be how it is so biblically the family is is an incubator to prepare us for how we interact in the real world that's what it's supposed to be 
and our families will be taught this. And I'll go so far as to say that if we teach our our uh, big brothers to be big brothers, to watch out for their little sisters um, or little brothers, that they will become good disciples and good um, good disciplers. Mm-hmm. So yeah, train them up when they're young, you yeah. know, in the ways of God, including discipleship. Okay, so the second the second scenario by which you're going to be ready to like disciple somebody and you just have to accept that is if you've helped to lead somebody to Christ, you know, you implicitly have that relationship, like, you know, introduce people to Christ, present the gospel and disciple them. Like this is all one thought in being taught by Christ. So if you've helped somebody, um, if you've helped to make a spiritual baby, right, then you have to share in the parenting of that spiritual baby. That's how it works in the biological reality. Whether you're ready or not for it, you have signed up for that. And that, like talking about how God does things, Mm -hmm. that's how God does things. We want to be like getting ourselves ready for this, um, this, that, and the other thing before we like jump in. That's not how God works. At a certain point, God's like, this is it. You're ready whether you think you're ready or not and i'm going to equip you to do this good work Mm -hmm. and then lastly um you're ready for discipleship when your master or mentor um thinks that you're ready like you have committed to um following them an example you've committed to trusting their wisdom if they counsel you that you're ready for discipleship then you should take that and run with it and ask them ask your you know master or mentor whatever you want to call them for support in your discipleship but don't deny your commission um to make disciples just because you're scared like look to your yeah. mentor for help in that yeah and i'll just know on the on the point before that and, and this point as well like it needs to be understood again you disciple discipleship um is the way that discipleship is talked about is follow me as I follow Christ, right? And uh, this this concept of um, following Christ and having, I think it was Pastor Adam talked about apostolic succession, mm-hmm. or no, not succession, authority. Um, having the authority that comes through scripture and gets passed down, you know, from disciple to disciple to disciple, all the way back to the teachings of the apostles and then to Jesus, and then even further back, the prophets and so on and so forth, is important. And so what needs to be understood is when you take on a disciple, they're not your responsibility alone. Again, we're not some weird Sith Lord master apprentice Mm -hmm. sort of thing going on. Instead, um, they have your mentor and their mentor's mentor and so on and so forth, going all the way back in theory to the teachings of the apostles and to Jesus himself. Yeah, well, like we talked about before, it's not so much that you're handing it from person to person, it's it's this person has their hand on Christ and then I take the next person's hand and put it on Christ, right? Right. (laughs) And then the following- So that everybody- Has a direct Everybody has a direct connection to Christ, yeah. And I think, again, we can look at the family, we can see how this is supposed to play out where uh, you are not disconnected from your grandparents. Your responsibility is to have a direct connection to your grandparents, and your grandparents then influence you also. So it's not just that your parents influence you, but that their parents influence you as well, as far back as they can muster because, you know, death. So even then, if you are forward-thinking, you can disciple somebody in legacy outside of time with things like writing, mm-hmm. right? Like learning from, if you if you are forward thinking, you can write things down for your grandchildren or your great grandchildren where they can learn about how to live through you. Which again is exampled by God, that right. specific type of discipleship. Like right. That's what so, we're doing when we're reading the apostles' writings. It's not meant to be, uh, you are my disciple and nobody else's. In fact, by being my disciple, you should be everybody else's. Mm-hmm. That's how that works. And vice versa. I should be being discipled by everybody else in that regard. Mm. So, and this, I want to um, 
bring it back a little bit because we went into the perspective of the the disciple for a second. But really, this today is about um, from the perspective of the person doing the discipling, the master or the mentor or whatever. And so as as the mentor, you should be looking at your disciple and thinking to yourself, is this person ready to disciple themselves? You know, to disciple another person is what I mean. To accept discipleship yeah. and to give discipleship. Yeah, is this person yeah. ready to give discipleship? Is the, you know, the next step of legacy um, able to be passed down and to have that be a, an active thought process because that's, that's what it is. It doesn't end with us. It's a continuing chain. Well, I think that, the, again, you think about families and that's, that's how you should be thinking about getting into relationships. If discipleship is the process and maintenance of making a spiritual being and maintenancing them mm -hmm. in the same vein, when you have, when you get into a relationship, your thought process shouldn't be, am I capable of doing this? It's, uh, sorry, not, am I, not, do I have the capacity to do this, but do, am I capable of doing it well? And you shouldn't, you shouldn't walk into relationships with other people where you can possibly make a baby and not intend to do that well. And I think that that's, that's a part of what you need to take into account. It's yeah. better not be in a relationship at all that way and just be parented and accept the blessings of your relationships that you have rather than going out and trying to make new ones unless you understand that with an understanding that you are working towards that, that, that is, that's a certain level of maturity um, and that the edict is go out and make. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... None of these things like we talked about are disconnected, right? Like each person who is thinking about um, discipling another person, well, that person who's thinking about that, that process and, and that next step in your um, Christian journey should be able to talk to their mentor, mm -hmm. right? And to get counsel from that person. And what better to get counsel from, you know, the person that's what better to get counsel about discipling another person than the person that's discipling you? Like that's the perfect situation. I know we're kind of hanging on this point for a long time. Uh, there's just one more area where I think it's important to consider your responsibility to disciple. And that is when the opportunity comes to you and there's nobody else. Mm, mm -hmm. And I think that I've seen this a lot in the church, in ministry, where there are people- Perfect just even feels that way. You know where I mean? yeah, where there are people who are hungry and thirsty for discipleship, and and they're approaching somebody that they trust, which is a rare thing, and that person says, ah, "I can't do this," and so then that person who needs it doesn't get what they need, and then they continue into a sin spiral or whatever. Like the it's the Deborah phenomenon, right? Yeah, it's like Deborah wasn't supposed to have needed to lead, but. God used her to do that, even though she wasn't in the ideal position. To so do then it. her faithfulness is stepping into that position. Yeah. So I just want to throw out there that this could be a problem if you're a lone wolf, right? But if you're not a lone wolf, if you're in community the way that you're supposed to and you view discipleship correctly, then your responsibility in that situation is to step into discipleship and then bring that person to the person that's mentoring you. Or, that, or a person who could mentor that person, rather than just be like, whoa, that's too much commitment for me, I'm not ready. And I think a lot of people do that, and a lot of people suffer because so many people have said, whoa, too much commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's just a big thing to combat in general in the faith is like, are you going to be worried more about yourself or are you gonna be worried more about the person whose spiritual life is at risk, you know, and hanging in the balance, because that's, that's what it is, is in, until we're like really um, taken on and adopted by other believers, like a person's, a person's relationship with Christ can be vulnerable to attack, mm -hmm. you know, is really, I think, the best way to put it. Because we need to keep in mind that all of this in, is in the context of spiritual warfare. You know, it's like throwing, you know, a little kid out onto the battlefield with you know, an oversized sword like David, you know, mm -hmm. like David went out in faith because he was being discipled by God and he knew God. Right. But when people tried to just like throw the armor on him and throw him out there, he's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die out there like this, <laughs> like this. Yeah. You know, but he was like, 
he had the wisdom to be like, this is how God wants me to be. And he went out and um, was safe in Christ. But if people don't know Christ directly like David did and somebody just throws armor on him and says, hey, go get him, tiger, like that person's not going to last long. And that's really sad, aside from the saving grace and intervention of God. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we were talking about judgment kind of and the log and the spec thing as being integral to discipleship. So the flip side of that coin is repentance, right? Is is as as the mentor, as the master in this relationship, you need to be asking and expecting repentance of your disciple. So that's really the first step in conversion even, right? Repent and believe. Like it's foundational to our our progress as disciples of Christ. Um, And it must be an ongoing process of repentance so that people can grow and follow God's commands Mm -hmm. being taught, right? As the Great Commission says. So let's take a look again, Josh, at Luke 24, uh, 44 to 48. It says, then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written, this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff in that passage, but it's kind of a, a parallel uh, to the Great Commission, specifically being tied in with Christ teaching it right at that right before he ascended in the Gospel of Luke, and he's talking about um, going out and proclaiming God's message by the authority of His name to all the nations, and then tying it in with repentance and forgiveness of sins, because that was the that was the the thrust right, of Christ's message um, throughout his ministry. And that's that's what discipleship continues. That's what discipleship offers as you're talking about the, the, the royal discipleship, right? Connecting people to Christ initially is, that's the message is, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent implicitly, not forgiveness for those who don't, mm-hmm. right? But that is the key for initial discipleship with Christ. Without repentance, there's no growth and there's no learning of God's commands. There's no process of discipleship without repentance. Um, and more importantly, there may be no forgiveness for this person. Well, it's just a return to sin. Yeah. Yeah. Return to sin, return to slavery, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a common issue that needs reminders from you as the person doing the discipling all the time. Like, I don't know what your experience is. Um, but in general, people get caught up in guilt. You know, people get caught up in sin over and over again. Like this is a, a real struggle, a real spiritual battle that people have um, all the time. And that doesn't stop when somebody decides to disciple them. Well, I think in, in my counseling experience, what I have found is that uh, pretty much almost every issue that a person has um, that they're going through unless it was pushed onto them and even how they handle that comes down to repentance. It really does. It, well, mm-hmm. it comes down to confession and repentance. Yeah. So, and then the, and then their recovery from that comes down to admittance, which would still be confession, discipline, and then putting themselves into a system that holds them accountable to that discipline, which is discipleship. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it it always comes down to confession and repentance. There's some, even if it's minute, you know, and, and people think that they've done a good job confessing and repenting because they've gotten rid of these big sins, right? But if you know anything about like, I think about uh, like a car car tires or, or bike tires, when something isn't true, even the smallest amount of deviation given a mile can send you in a completely different direction than you were intended to go. No cause where. Yeah. Abnormal wear. Yeah. And, tear. and so it's it's important for you. Yeah, maybe you've gotten rid of the big things, but if you haven't repented of the little nuanced things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the little footholds, right? Yeah. The devil yeah, takes. that's what the scripture calls them, footholds. And so it's it's important for you to to always be, you know, always be doing that. And some people think that they're 
I, I don't have these big problems anymore that I used to have. So what is there to confess and repent of? But no, there's these, there's always these little things. And that's part of the benefit of walking with somebody and watching them be nuanced in their approach while you're being large in your approach. You know, it, it is the mundane things that need to be repented of. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But as the, the master and the mentor and the relationship, <clears throat> what we need to be prepared to do is to demand repentance, mm -hmm. right? Demand mm -hmm. confession and repentance demand the acceptance of forgiveness, yeah. right? Because if you don't accept the forgiveness in your heart, then you're undercutting Christ and all the sacrifice and work that he did. Mm -hmm. Like it's essential to accept um, that forgiveness and own it fully. And so as the, the person doing the mentoring, like we need to make sure that that process is happening. And then we can yeah. move on to the to the grind, to the mechanical work right. of figuring out, you know, processes that will avoid sin and to, you know, be wise and all these different things. Yeah, Paul says, or is it Peter? It could be either. It's both in theology. Um, says that you literally are putting Christ back on the cross when yeah. you ref when you refuse to accept it. And I just want to point out, as Colin was saying, I want to string it together. It's not just the specifics of these things confession, repentance, uh, discipleship, whatever. It is a cohesive package. It's a process. You have to accept the process of confession and repentance, not just the idea of one or the other, you know, as if you can piecemeal these things together. Yeah, and teach it's, faith in the process. Right. It's You have to, yeah, have faith in, in God's process that he's given us for how to sanctify us and make us holy. And that's all of, all of it together. And if you're like, oh, I'll take this, but I won't take that, you're not trusting the process, and that's why you're having a problem nine times out of ten in my in my counseling experience. And as we know from just foundational, just overarching theology, like change comes from from repetition, from God saturation. I don't want to. I don't want to say rep. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Well, I don't want to say that um, change happens from the inside out, like my notes say in front of me. Um, mm. <laughs> but change more specifically is an outside force from God yeah. changing the inside of us. It's transcendent right? in nature. Yeah. yeah. And then by the Holy Spirit, you're able to like make progress and be be taken down that process of discipleship and sanctification. Well, and but the, we need to make sure that, that that process of people accepting God's work on them is happening over and over. And over and over. Yeah. And the, the, the change that's really happening is an orientation. Right. Mm -hmm. So instead, and this is where we get into the repentance, but it's, it's the constant, I, I, I am turning this way. Like I think of a lever, you know, like you pull a lever and then it snaps back into position and you have to keep pulling it over and over and over again. And eventually the muscle memory of you pulling that lever makes it less hard to pull, makes it more, uh, turns it into a sort of mundane task that is just a part of what you do. And we call this humility. Yeah, humiliating yourself <laughs> in that process. Yeah. So it is it's a repetition of the orientation of the leaning into God's processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on this next part, you know, because repent, confess, repent, and be baptized. That's all part of the same process and part of making disciples. <clears throat> I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I just want to ask the question: what about baptism? You know, what about the the command to be repent, repentant and be baptized. Do we emphasize this enough, you know, as believers or even in our church specifically? But <clears throat> what I want to highlight is that if you are somebody that has a disciple, you need to be thinking about their baptism, mm -hmm. right? Like this is a sacrament. It's not essential for salvation technically, but it is highly um, <clears throat> integrated into the whole concept of becoming a faithful believer in Christ. And if it's at all possible, this is something that we should partake in and encourage people to take seriously and to partake in themselves. And if you have somebody that's under your care, part of that process is allowing them to accept the death and resurrection of Christ um, through partaking in that ceremony mm -hmm. that specifically honors mm -hmm. and accepts it. So 
yeah, I don't want to get into too crazy of a discussion, but that is a central point um, that we really should be thinking about and processing, especially as the church retreat comes up here in a few weeks. Where we traditionally do those things. Ba- yeah, baptism is a, it's a, like he said, it's a sacrament and sacraments are blessings upon the church. And it's just, it's very simple. Like you need to accept the blessing. And if you don't, then that tells you something about your confession and repentance of, yeah, I don't want to accept that blessing. I will accept this and not that. That's not very disciplined. Mm-hmm. So, but, but you're right that a large portion of it is people not discipling in that direction. And, uh, it's without getting, like you said, too much into the theology of it. It's not necessary for salvation, but a mature believer will want to go in that direction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, so yeah, it's your role in discipling to counsel on this and to, to be a leader in that um, specific department. Um, the one thing that I promised last week is that we'd talk a little bit more about the difference between mentorship and discipleship. We just call things mentorship around here. Um, and I think that's fine, but it's worth discussing. Um, mentorship is like adding somebody to your schedule, right? Penciling them in for this hour or that hour or relegated to a specific skill set or something like I'm really good at art. And so I'm going to like teach this person how to be an artist. And in that you can have legitimate, um, legitimate teaching that transcends the art right you can Mm -hmm. teach about god through art um but that's not necessarily discipleship that's mentorship in this in a more relegated sense Mm -hmm. and uh this guy grant skeldon he's a a young younger man and he had some really good discussion on this on youtube so you can check that uh, that out if you want but um what i kind of um wrapped it up as you know is come and meet with me versus come and follow me, which is discipleship. And those two things are very different, right? And discipleship is is revealing. It's it's vulnerable for the person that's doing the discipling because you're not adding someone to your schedule. Right. You're adding somebody to your entire calendar. You're to opening your life, your life yeah. and inviting that person to come alongside you to see you um, fight with your wife, to see some yep. to see you discipline your children to see you work out finances and open your pocketbook, you know, for heaven's sake, you know, we wouldn't want to do that and share our finances with anybody. Yeah. It's to see your weaknesses, right? Yeah. That's, I mean, everybody to be able to learn from them. Mentorship is, is really about seeing your successes, but yeah. discipleship is about seeing your weaknesses and mm-hmm. mentorship is about teaching somebody. Discipleship is about integrating somebody. So yeah, and giving them opportunities to also discipline your children yeah. or to um, come in like, you know, the other the other day I invited Hayden to come in and pray with me and my family because we were like together. And that was an intentful act of discipleship. Right. And mm-hmm. it's that's a small thing. Um, but that's the idea of what we want to do is open up our our mind to be geared toward thinking where can i integrate this person Mm -hmm. i know you're um you know you're famous for like taking people and specifically younger kids and stuff on vacations with your family right yeah yeah we like to look for opportunity my wife and i again colin alluded to it but we've sort of adopted um definitely fostered many many people and our thought process has always been to allow people an opportunity to see how we do things, mostly so that those people have a choice. Um, A lot of people have the one thing that they've learned from their parents or from, you know, maybe the school system or something. They, They don't feel that they have a choice to be different in any way. I'm not saying people have to choose what I or have even thought that there might be an ability to be different. Right. You know? I'm not I'm not saying that people have to choose the way that I live my life, but I want them to know that they can choose to to do those things. And so, yeah, like and that a, person might, you know, in a few years be like, I really want to be a disciple of this person. Like, mm-hmm. I like the way that they do things. And I think what Colin said is true. Like uh, he mentioned, like arguing with your <laughs> with your wife, like. Uh, one of the things that can be really jarring with me and my wife is that we're very open when we argue and we're not, we're, we're definitely not famous for um, 
blowing up at each other or anything like that. Um, and we're really good at resolving conflict, but we are, but we are open about having conflict. And I think that that is really important for people to watch me and my wife make mistakes. Well, uh, and for me personally, even I, I have, you would call it a core memory, right? From sure. From, a core memory. Yeah. <laughs> from what's that movie? Inside out. Yeah. Um, Inside Out 2, now in theaters. All right. But a, a core memory of you and your dad arguing in the fellowship hall, mm. you know? And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, like, this is what arguing can look like. Mm. Like, this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's important for people to see you be frustrated, to see you, uh, you know, struggle with your weaknesses, your temptations, uh, to see you be tired, so on and so forth, because those are the things that we keep hidden, right? Those are the things where people really need that they that they deal with on a daily basis, um, but nobody wants to talk about. Nobody wants to show when they're frustrated. No, you know, mm-hmm. nobody wants to show what they're struggling with. But to watch you struggle with those things and remain and and discipline yourself back to God is how they're going to learn how to discipline themselves back to God. And being open enough to to be open or to welcome a conversation about that with your Mm -hmm. disciple, right? Or even invite them into a discussion about Mm -hmm. that with your disciple. That takes some maturity, you know, to be like, hey, did you see how I sucked the other day? What did you think about that? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Like that's some real maturity in an interesting, um, you know, kind of inverted worldly manner. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a humbling experience, and I think it, it is true. Like discipleship at its very basics is vulnerability, right? Mm-hmm. Like it it is being vulnerable. There is something to be said for the fact that when God decided that it was time to usher in His kingdom, He did it with Christ, and Christ's premise for that wasn't coming down and speaking from a pulpit. It was him living day in and day out for three years with these people, eating with them, As drinking, a poor guy, not a rich guy, sleeping, fancy struggling things. to survive. <laughs> right, exactly. And and there's just a lot of ministry that doesn't happen that way, and I think that that's wrong. Yeah. Well, and that brings us to that next little bullet point there that this process of discipleship and discipling others it causes us to have to dig deep and clarify our theology and hermeneutics, you know, our, our application of scripture. Um, because all of these things in our, in our weaknesses and the processes of life and asking the question, why do you do things and and stuff, you know, um, it really makes us be introspective and, and look to see where we're at Mm -hmm. as our own, um, discipleship with Christ is going and how that's going. And those things are blessings too. A lot of people, many, many, many people, hopefully everybody who has discipled somebody who's been a mentor, um, reflecting on that, hopefully everybody thinks that it is difficult and uh, a burden, but a blessing that they would never trade in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So in terms of how we're calling people, I want to I wanna just read... Um, Mark chapter 1, 16 through 20, real quick. All right. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, 16 through 20. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Yeah. So in this, we see a real change in priority, right, for people um, as they're being called as disciples. And so Jesus, he's doing the calling. Um, He's calling them to a change in life concerns, right? He's calling them to a change in leadership. Uh, some of those disciples, the first batch were described as being in the process of making money, right? They were actively fishing. They're bringing in fish with their family. I think it was John and Andrew, I want to say, but, um, Jesus called them to set it aside, like stop worrying about the making money right now. Come follow me. Right. 
and then some of the other disciples, they were dealing with the everyday practical struggles. They were repairing their fishing nets, like the mundane stuff of life in order to make ends meet or whatever. Again, Jesus called people to look at greater concerns and the deeper truths, um, which don't lead to everyday struggles um, and resolving those things directly, but they lead to eternal life. Like that is ultimately what we're calling our disciples um, to pay attention to and the reason why they are to follow us as we follow Christ. This is our, this is our goal. Um, I think that's fine for brevity purposes. Do you have anything to speak to that one? Um, I was completely distracted. <laughs> Somebody walked in while it's we just, were filming. It's just, yeah, it's just, anyway, Jesus, when he called the disciples, when they were fishing in their boats and repairing their nets, like they stopped what they were doing. They stopped making money. They stopped repairing and doing yeah. the everyday struggles of stuff. It leads to a right? transformation in the way that you live. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. discipleship is not a call to, to, um, you know, swing a hammer better or to sow things better. Like those can be benefits of the discipleship relationship, but that's not what it's about, right? Yeah. Jesus taught people through all sorts of things, but he wasn't teaching them about those little things. Yeah. Like he was teaching them about God. And that was his, his, um, his task from his father, right? In his right. discipleship relationship with the father, he was tasked to carry out the doctrine of the father, to carry out the teaching and the 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 gift and the offer offer of yeah. the father well for i think people to be forgiven of their sins and to follow him i think very clearly discipleship is not to be viewed as a commodity where you get some sort of earthly gain um though that is a benefit honestly yeah. but uh that's not the point of it and that's what you're saying and, and it goes back to that discussion of what is discipleship it's not mentorship in nature mentorship is an aspect that grows from a discipleship relationship mm -hmm. if you're looking to get mentored in something you just want an experience or some sort of you know get that from something else yeah yeah there's lots of lots of resources youtube is a fantastic mentor mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah so but in general as this, jesus is calling his disciples we see, see real ownership from the get-go from the intent of it um, on a deep level to call them to to more significant theological um, things. I, I just want to add, I have seen more men leave our church because they were looking to get mentored um, mm -hmm. and they were given discipleship instead. And so uh, it's an important distinction. Like when you are when you are being discipled, it is holistic and vulnerable and and it is hard. And if your thought process is, I just want the skills to navigate my life rather than I want to crucify my life and take on Christ's. Yeah. And when the way that Jesus the did that, like he almost, I'm sure he did tell them his disciples, but he almost didn't have to tell them because they were in the middle of doing life. And he said, hey, live a different life with me. Yep. It's transformative. Yeah. Um, so we see real ownership from the master on a deep level in that way. Um, let's look at this passage real quick. Colossians one twenty eight. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. Yep. And that's really what it is, is ownership of, of, you know, stewarding another believer in their relationship to Christ and teaching them to obey the commands of God, teaching them to understand the commands and the values of God, the doctrine of um, of God from beginning to end in scripture. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just tying that back in with teaching people to observe uh, the commands of God. And in this process, um, kind of almost bringing it full circle, just talking about viewing people and owning them as part of your family, as part of your children. I just wanted to look at Paul really quick and how he talks about that in first Corinthians really chapters four through six, where he's, he's going to town and like warning and admonishing them. Um, but he's doing it for a point today. He's doing it because he recognizes his role as their spiritual father. So as people who are discipling others, are we recognizing ourselves as their spiritual father or mother in that? So let's read first Corinthians four, 14 to 17. 
I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. That's why I've sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Yeah. So we see Paul sort of processing that being and owning this role of spiritual father with them, not not from this, um, you know, arrogant or or um, reward based place where he wants to get praise for that, but because of the responsibility of it. Right. And then he goes and trains Timothy as his disciple and hands it off to, to Timothy and says, now this is your role as I step out and I'm continuing my um mission and my discipleship with Christ and going out and, and fulfilling my commission. You know, Paul's speaking that, but he's like, here, Timothy, now as you take this baton, you're leading this church. You are now their spiritual father. I think, Get it. yeah, I think that the, the specificity of that passage where he, he says, you may have 10,000 other, you know, teachers or whatever, but I am your spiritual father is important. It's important to note because I think a lot of people think that because you have a you have you can get information from a lot of people or discipleship from a lot of especially people especially today mm-hmm, that 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 therefore means that the personal relationship can somehow be um forsook is forsook the right term sure yeah forsaken um <laughs> And then the other factor is there's a, there's a lot of people who <laughs> there's a lot of people who say that who would say, for instance, uh, I'll say this from for Colin because it would hit too close to home if I said it. But if Colin was to say, "I am your spiritual father," a lot of people would say, "How dare you say that? God is my spiritual father. Nobody else can be my spiritual father. Only God." And the specificity of this passage where Paul claims ownership and responsibility and adopts Timothy is a godly perspective. There's nothing wrong with him saying, I am your spiritual father. It also doesn't negate if somebody else like Pastor Adam was to say, so let's say that Colin says to Hayden, which is is, uh, Colin's direct um, mentee, um, I am your spiritual father. And then Adam develops a mentorship relationship with him as well. And he says, I am your spiritual father. That doesn't negate that ownership from top to bottom. Um, that's not what's being talked about here either. So what we're talking about here is that mm-hmm. Paul is taking a direct ownership and it is rightful for him to do so. And it does not make him a cult leader for, yeah. <laughs> for him and, to say, I'm your spiritual father. And it should be noted that, you know, in another, in another passage, Paul's saying like, from from the disciples' perspective, like why are you claiming distinctions? Like, oh, this is my spiritual father, or this is my spiritual right. father. You know, Paul's my spiritual father. No, 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 Apollos. Apollos is my spiritual mm-hmm. father. Everybody's spiritual father is Christ, and we all know that. You know, this is not this is not a a I don't know what you call it. This is not a competition, right? And Paul's not in a competition with anybody. He's not doing the thing that the Pharisees do where they're counting their disciples. Well, he's not taking, like, he's not making a... He's holding the burden, right. the good burden. He's not making a theological statement on the submission structure yeah. of, or, or on the ontology of spirituality. That's not what he's doing. He's saying, I have been burdened with this. I have taken this on. You are my child. I am your father. Let's not pretend that relationship doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's implicit in a discipleship relationship. Yep. Yep. It's pretty cool. And then that passage ends there. You know, it's, Timothy is going to remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches, wherever I go. Mm-hmm. So again, there's this, this real continuity to it and ownership of these relationships um, and no shame whatsoever mm-hmm. about it. No secrecy as Josh put it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Let's, Continue on with 2 Corinthians 12, 14 to 15. Now I'm coming to you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Rather, parents provide for their children. I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. Man, that is a parent. That's a person who knows what it is to parent at least adult children. Yeah. And this is something like, this is a, a warning for, 
for people um, looking to disciple others rightly is a warning, um, but it's also a blessing. Like if you were to talk to Paul about this, he would say that it is his honor and p- privilege mm-hmm. to suffer for these people, even though they're right. going down kicking and screaming half the time. And when right. they don't go down kicking and screaming, when they pull a Timothy and they rise up under that challenge and they disciple others, he is filled with joy. Elated. You know? And that's that's the type of investment that we need. Um, yeah, we need to have those things at stake. Mm-hmm. Well, the, if you were to talk to James about it, the Apostle James, he would say that the that type of adversity creates perfection in in the believer so that he is able to to withstand anything you know that he's complete and perfect and lacking in nothing because he's leaning in to being faithful Mm. so yeah and, and that's something to be considered again when we say this like discipleship is vulnerable yeah yes it is um okay so the next thing about this is is just that paul's process of this like the reason why he had that that burden and that consequence and and people not loving him you know at certain points is because he was disciplining them Mm -hmm. as a father you know kids don't always like to be disciplined and they may be mad for a while especially when they're like teenagers Mm -hmm. or whatever and they're rebellious but under the surface that's what people need that's even what people love um so though it may come at a cost there are many benefits too and we need to note that and engage in discipleship faithfully faithfully meaning there's evidence of things unseen right like the we've seen it happen over and over again that god's model for how to do things works best and builds his church in the right way um so yeah we need to well that. i would say that for me in my experience with discipleship which can be really difficult the part of love in first corinthians 13 which is not about marriage it's about the church working in unison with each other um which i suppose is a type of marriage it's not about romantic love anyway but the type of love in the descriptions love is you know love is joyful love is patient like all these things right mm-hmm. the one that applies most here is that love hopes for all things um, it's the thing that i keep going back to when i think about discipleship you have to have this hope that what you're doing is meaningful yeah so. yeah definitely um <clears throat> okay so in this process let's go back to john chapter 8 uh, 31 through 36. That says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham. They said, we have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. I like this passage because it sort of wraps in a lot of these different themes. It talks about being a part of the same family. It talks about, um, you know, breaking free from sin. It talks about remaining faithful and following the teachings of Christ. Um, All these different things wrapped into one. And the other thing that I want to highlight in this is that you can't have two masters, right? And so as a person discipling another one, you need to be watching out for that and making sure that they have the correct master and that's matthew 6 24 if you want to look at that tiny little passage right there but um part of making and taking a disciple is helping them to be jailbroken right Mm. like we all come from sin uh before christ came for us and he has been raised to break the power of sin but like we talked about earlier, people are still tangled up with it and go back to the bondage of sin and have suffered a lot of consequences and damage from it. And so as a person discipling another one, we're to like root out those parts and help them um, to be broken out of that, 
that prison or to to leave it i guess like the doors mm-hmm. are open you know if we want to follow the analogy christ has opened the doors but people have to leave and to not be drawn back um to the prison culture or whatever right. where it's easy to right. you know, go about three life. square meals a day and yeah. four walls i i think it's important uh, again the passage um which is one of the most misunderstood passages in scripture you will know the truth and the truth will set you free right mm-hmm. It's important to note that the context of that is that the truth that you will know is basically the veracity of Christ's teachings. So if you are faithful to that truth, in other words, if you are disciplined in that truth, Mm -hmm. then that truth will set you free. Yep. And so again, we see this concrete, this adherence. Yeah. We see this adherence to, to being disciplined. Yeah. Yeah. And having somebody that has been through those processes Mm -hmm. and, you know, after confession and repentance, after, um, you know, turning from those ways and being willing to accept forgiveness and then working out the details of what that looks like to really escape and guard against those things that try to draw a person back into sin. Mm -hmm. Um, I think about the show Prison Break. It's been a long time since that. Like 20 years. But I know you're a big fan (laughs) of it, too. But the main character in that, don't even remember his name. Michael Schofield. Michael Schofield. He, you know, his brother gets in trouble. He goes into to prison and Michael, he tattoos his entire body, right? And yep. then gets himself to go into prison. And on his body is tattooed and marked with all the ways to break free out of that prison. And that's really what this discipleship kind of situation is. Is we figure, you know, through Christ, we have figured out and lived the process of what it looks like to get out of this prison and to break free from these different bondages. Let me come alongside you and I'm going to go, you know, into the, to the battlefield and draw you out. And I've taken with me the things that Christ has given, Mm -hmm. you know? And I just think that's a really epic illustration of that Mm -hmm. reaching in and having your entire body marked with the, the scars that it took to break free. You know, Mm -hmm. if you decide that you want to check out prison break, I would suggest you only watch the first season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second one is okay, but <laughs> yeah, first one is really good. Um, and then finally, just as we're bringing this to a close, disciples need to turn into apostles, right? Which I think um, yeah. you guys talked about the last um, Sunday study of last month. Apostles are sent ones. Jesus made disciples, and then he turned them into apostles and sent them out. Mm-hmm. If the Great Commission is passed down, so must be the chain of discipleship and we need to in our minds like change people um, and be working people toward um, apostleship not just uh, discipleship right and being right. able to be sent and be ready to be a servant for Christ right well and it's important to note that apostleship are those who are sent by Christ directly that's the that's the concept of it right so again discipleship it doesn't stop with the person who is discipling it is a gateway for people to have a relationship with christ that is direct to the point where now the great commission which applied to you applies to them so your disciple is not your disciple (laughs) like you you are you're stewarding them toward a relationship with christ and so yeah discipleship must become apostleship and when you send them out you don't send them out in your name right right? you send them out in the name of christ and with the authority of christ right as promised so let's take a look at one final scripture second timothy 2 1 and 2 it says timothy my dear son be strong through the grace that god gives you in christ jesus you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Yep. So that's our that's our goal is to make and to take and make disciples and have them take and make disciples in turn. And this is just a really concise specific command um, from Paul to his disciple telling him to continue that process. And uh, this doesn't just mean good behavior or accurate doctrine, but both of them unified together in one worldview and one lifestyle that represents Christ, that shows that he is from the Father, and that his promises are good and have fruit. Right. Yep. So I think that pretty much wraps us up 
for today in terms of looking at the person doing the discipling and, and what that really entails as a snapshot. Next week, we're going to look from the disciples' perspective more in terms of what that looks like and the, the doctrine and the theology and the principles behind that. So let's just look at a few questions and think about these, and we'll pray to close after a hot minute. So <clears throat> what does or should drive you to disciple others? What does or should drive you to disciple others? Number two, what is your biggest fear or reservation about discipling, and how can you overcome that? Not just if that is some like a feeling, maybe it's just a feeling, but maybe it's also something concrete, like maybe you got a log somewhere. You know, What do you need to do in order so that you can be in a position to fill God's commission for you to make disciples? Mm-hmm. And thirdly, what is your hope? For future disciples, what is your hope for your future disciples and what they are doing and enabled to do from the the fruit of your labors as their spiritual father or mother? So that's all for today, folks. If you found this content to be helpful, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel, ABF PDX. Think about who might benefit from these things and uh, this content in your life, <clears throat> and share the video with them. Uh, Go ahead and visit our webpage, abfpdx.org, where you can find plenty of more content, helpful stuff in the form of sermons or studies or podcasts and those kinds of things. Um, Also, there's contact info for us if you want to ask questions or to look for more resources. We're on social media also at abfpdx or at biblical advice, which is a weekly source for bursts of biblical wisdom from Mr. Josh McGarry here sitting there. Um, So please utilize those resources that we have made available in a way that is edifying to you and to others and in a way that brings you closer to God and his word through discipleship, through scriptural um, study, through all of these things taken seriously from our commands from God. And have a good day and go with God. And we will pray to close. I'll take it away. Father in heaven, thank you for your examples to us. Thank you for your demonstration of discipleship. Thank you for um, just the cohesive um, cohesive counsel and concepts and reality that you have built um, and allowed us the blessing of living within. Pray that your spirit would fill each of us and enable us to disciple others and to help them um, to be better disciples of your son, Jesus Christ. Pray all these things. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.